Paul Wipke. On July 10th, 1958, First Lieutenant Paul Byron Wipke, a proud and intelligent 26-year-old American company commander, mysteriously vanished from his post at Fort Ord, California. He told other officers that he would go out for a drink to the town of Monterey, but no one ever saw him again. The next day, the Army declared him absent without leave or AWOL. After a month, he was considered a deserter, which prompted both his family and the government to open up an investigation. Based on the FBI's gatherings, on July 10th, hours after leaving the fort, Whippy checked in in a motel 100 miles away in Mojave. A day later, he bought 14 gallons of gas and ventured into a desolated region of Death Valley, where his 1956 Chevrolet was found with the keys still in the ignition. His dog tags, a suitcase, and cigarettes were also found in the car. Strangely enough, the lieutenant did not smoke. Other than that, there was no trace of him. The investigation concluded that Whipke had suffered a mental breakdown and decided to wander in the desert, where he probably died from extreme heat. The lieutenant's brother, Carl Whipke, dissatisfied with the Army's and FBI's story because of certain discrepancies, decided to investigate himself. Carl's suspicions began when he attempted to call his brother on July 12th, two days after he went missing, and realized that the Army had already packed his belongings from the barracks to send them home. Another inconsistency that Carl discovered occurred days before his brother was declared a deserter. A rancher reported seeing a man dressed in military uniform, driving a 1956 Chevrolet near the location where Paul's car was found. Strangely enough, when the lieutenant left the fort on July 10th, he did so in civilian clothing. Carl concluded that the Army or the CIA decided to get rid of his brother because he was a special agent. When Carl went over his brother's assignments and belongings, he discovered that Lieutenant Whipke was part of Operation Plum Bob. Apparently, he flew several planes under nuclear weapon detonations, which considerably deteriorated his health for radiation exposure. Based on his commanding officer's testimony, Lieutenant Whipke was approached on several occasions by the CIA, who attempted to recruit him for specific missions related to nuclear armament. Decades passed, and Carl managed to clear his brother's name in 1982 by forcing the army to change his status to died in the line of duty instead of deeming him a deserter. To this date, the mystery of Lieutenant Whipke's disappearance has not been solved. Matthew Warren Brown On May 11, 2008, 20-year-old Matthew Warren Brown, a private second class of the U.S. Army, made his way to Islamabad base's watchtower. It was 6 a.m. in the morning, cold and dark outside. Many soldiers who passed by saw him and noted that he was acting strangely, as if drunk. Brown had taken Valium the night before to cope with the tensions of being in a war zone. Nevertheless, he was allowed to stay in the gun tower and on duty, given his condition. Minutes later, as the rest of the men took breakfast, his sergeant called him over the comms to see how he was doing. Brown responded vaguely. Later, the sergeant showed up below the watchtower with a Gatorade and breakfast for Brown. He shouted several times, but no response came from above. When the sergeant got to the top, he found Brown was no longer alive. His M4 carbine lay nearby, and a single shell casing was on the ground. After radioing the base, the medics arrived to analyze the scene and concluded Brown's end had been self-inflicted. Nevertheless, when his mother, Sandra Evans, was notified about the incident, a complicated mystery began. She told army officers that her son confessed to being part of a drug ring during his last visit home. Brown said that he wanted out, but the sergeant in charge of the drug deal threatened him. During his visit, Brown told his mom, quote, I'm going to die soon, mom. They're going to kill me. Thus, a meticulous investigation began to unravel the conspiracy. At first, the army did not punish anyone and paid no attention to Brown's mother's pledge for justice. Thus, she hired a lawyer to force the military to study the case. Her lawyer determined that the case was flawed from the beginning. The first red flag was that the accident's cleanup crew erased every possible clue of the crime scene. The same happened with Brown's M4, which was taken by a sergeant and thoroughly cleaned. Lastly, and possibly the most crucial aspect of the mystery behind Brown's death, was that the military did not perform ballistics tests to determine the bullet's trajectory. In 2018, 10 years later, 
the case was reopened. However, the verdict remained the same. Ralph Sigler. In typical Cold War fashion, Ralph Sigler embodied the life of a true spy. Of Eastern European heritage, Sigler migrated to the U.S. two decades before the Iron Curtain fell over Czechoslovakia, which made him apt for the double agent status when joining the U.S. military in 1947. While stationed in West Germany, he married his wife, Ilsa, in 1955. After years of service in the army, Sigler was approached by CIA officers in 1966 when he became a double agent. His past and heritage made him a strong candidate for the counter-espionage role against the USSR. In December of that year, Sigler arrived in Mexico City to fulfill his first mission. His task was simple. Make Soviet friends among the KGB officers stationed in the city, where the USSR had its main center of espionage on the continent. Eventually, he was approached by Russian agents that promised him tons of money and VIP treatment for his mother in Czechoslovakia, a country under the grip of the communist regime. In exchange, he only had to give the agents classified information regarding the U.S. missile program. He agreed and began supplying the KGB with false documents given to him by the CIA. The Soviets never suspected he was a double agent. Sigler continued to work with the Soviets until 1976, when after months of traveling to Europe and Mexico, he returned to the States to keep the CIA up to date about his missions and be examined with a polygraph test. Results indicated that he was deceptive when responding to questions regarding his relationship with the Soviets. This alarmed the Army intelligence, who believed Sigler had turned on them. When Sigler was interrogated for the last time, he was staying alone in San Francisco. He called his wife, Ilsa, and with an alarmed voice, told her to hire a lawyer to sue the U.S. Army. His last words to her were, quote, I am dying. I never lied. Hours later, Sigler was found in his motel room near Fort Meade, Maryland. According to the Army and the police, he had electrical wires around his arms. The police inspected the room and found no evidence of a struggle. Sigler's body reportedly only had an unusual wound in the nose, but his body had no signs of violence. Nonetheless, when his daughter saw him, she saw that he was missing several teeth. This led the family to believe that Sigler was targeted by the KGB, who discovered his true allegiance, or by the CIA, who had doubts about his recent behavior. Mark Dennis. In 1964, Mark V. Dennis, a young and profoundly religious lineman from the Miamisburg High School football team, graduated and joined the U.S. Navy to serve in Vietnam as a Navy corpsman. Happy to serve his country and his God, Dennis hoped to help the war effort and become a missionary. In early 1966, he was assigned to a USMC unit as a corpsman and chaplain. Anxious to join the men in combat, on July 15, 1966, Dennis and his unit departed for the DMZ aboard a CH-46 Chinook helicopter. They were going to take part in Operation Hastings. While approaching the LZ, the aircraft took ground fire and crashed. Most of the men aboard didn't make it, including Dennis. Dennis was in such a bad shape that the military recommended that the family not have an open coffin ceremony. The man they saw barely resembled Dennis. Some of his brothers thought he looked Asian, not Caucasian. Nevertheless, Dennis was put to rest, and the family moved on. Yet years later, Jerry Dennis, Mark's older brother, saw a photograph of unidentified prisoners of war at the Hanoi Hilton prison in North Vietnam. One of the men depicted strongly resembled his brother, which prompted Jerry to investigate if his brother had indeed died. Later, he met a veteran who survived the fatal crash with his brother. He told him that Mark did not die during the accident. As a result, Jerry sent his brother's remains for a forensic test. The results left the whole family in awe. Tests concluded that the remains were those of an Asian man of about 5 feet 7 inches in height. Mark was close to 6 feet tall. Nevertheless, the Navy continued to affirm that the remains truly belonged to the deceased Navy corpsman and ran another forensic test in 2016 that reaffirmed their conclusion. Mark's alleged remains were officially laid to rest in 2016 with full military honors. To this date, the family believes they belong to somebody else. Yosef Allen. Yo 
Yosef Allen was a renowned Israeli Air Force officer, participated in the Israeli War of Independence as a fighter pilot. He became one of the first jet pilots of his country. In 1970, he was chosen as the Air and Naval Attaché of Israel's embassy in Washington, D.C. On the night of June 30, 1973, after arriving home from a dinner party with his wife, Allen was shot five times by an unknown attacker that showed up in his front yard. The police were unable to determine who the man was and why he had committed the crime. On July 1st, however, an Egyptian broadcast claimed Colonel Yosef Allen had been targeted by government agents. Based on this statement, the FBI concluded that the killer could have been a Lebanese or Cypriot spy. They believed that he entered the U.S. through Canada and returned to the Middle East following the attack. The case was reopened in 2017 after new leads pointed at the potential involvement of an American citizen. The case remains unsolved. <laughs>